Yesterday, I penciled, inked, and edited this knight, who is burly, but has soft little antennae like a lunamoth. It's from a comic I'm working on, so I promise it does make sense in context. But I screen captured the entire inking process, and now I'm going to walk through it with a little bit of commentary showing it to you, sped up, so that this video isn't too long. If you like this kind of video, let me know down in the comments. Because I'm relatively new to YouTube, I don't really know what kinds of videos my subscribers would like to see, so let me know. And while you are down there, give it a like and subscribe if you have not yet. I've also learned that I am very much at the mercy of the algorithm of YouTube, and anything you do helps. Let's get to the inking. For clarity's sake, this is going to be a video that is primarily about methods, and so I'm going to talk specifically about techniques. If you're interested in theory, I do have a video for that, and I'll link it here and in the description down below. So the first thing you will probably notice is that this is uh, already partially drawn. And that's because it was going so well, I didn't think to start recording until I was already a little ways into it. But I was so happy with that Jean-Luc Picard nose that I had given him that uh, I forgot all about hitting the record button. So when I'm inking, I usually start with the face. One of the reasons I do that is because, A, that's probably the thing I'm going to be most frustrated with if it goes wrong. And so I'd rather do it first to find out whether or not this whole process is working. And then also, it tends to be very heavy on detail, and I usually set a tone for myself on how much detail I want, based upon how I do it on the face. Already here on the face, you can see one of the principles that I do talk about in my theory video, which is choosing a light direction. I picked a light direction that was basically right above, but a little bit to the left. And I'm relatively consistent with that, although I admit that sometimes... I lose track of it and do what looks good instead of what is necessarily the perfectly logical outcome. But a lot of times it's not about perfection. It's about getting close enough to where the audience gets the general sense of how the shadows are oriented. When I'm inking hair, I tend to leave the lines very open. This is something I have not come up with myself. I've learned it by looking at a variety of artist. So a lot of quick lines and a lot of gaps between those lines to give it that feathery sfumato look. Once I move down to the collar, this is the first time you'll see me really black something in that's a large area. And what I'm doing there is closing off the inks within that area and using the selection tool, the magic wand in Photoshop, to select the area inside. I expand that selection just a little bit, which you can do from the menu in Photoshop, but I have it mapped to an extra button on my mouse so that I just select, expand, and then I fill it in with black uh, using the fill option in Photoshop. Here on the collar, you can see me taking a shot at shadows on metal. In order to give something a metallic look, as though it has a slightly uneven handmade surface, I do a wobbly line around to create the shadow, and then I fill it in with black. You'll see me cut notches out of those as well. On the shoulder plate, I'm leaving little rivets of light, something that when I fill it in with dark, there'll still be a smattering of light visible, and that's just to help with the sense of three-dimensionality so that it's not a totally dark area, but there's something to carry the attention across the gap. I do prefer to map out a lot of the big areas of black once I get down to the body. I do this because the more you understand the larger map of shadows on the figure, the easier it is to detect where something might be missing. You'll see that come up later. Up here across the top of the shoulder, in the same way that I did with the top of the head, I left a line break that's directed towards the light source. So this is a break in the line, which I call the invisible, or sometimes you'll hear it called the implied line, that essentially thins out and breaks because it's so close to the light source. So heavy, sh heavy lines away from the light source, very, very thin or even broken lines towards the light source. It gives the sense of reflection. After I have blocked in basic areas of black, I will start experimenting with hatching. And hatching is something I try to do in a minimal way because it's so easy to overdo. And here, I get particularly bold, and I even try a little bit of cross-hatching, which I rarely trust myself to do, but here I actually think it works quite well. 
One of the important things with hatching is just to ensure that you're leaving some space between each line. Uh, that helps make it feel cleaner, and again, not scribbling back and forth, but doing all of my lines in the same direction, going towards the light source. Down on this arm, I'm mapping out the shadows, and this is actually supposed to be covered with very tight cloth and so there's going to be a lot of small wrinkles that manifest on that surface and so I'm mapping those out generally as one big shape which I'll fill in with black and then I'll go in and add little bits of texture, little bits of wrinkle, extra things that add to the detail and the intricacy of the body. See when it's just the black it feels kind of blank. It feels like it's lacking something. So I go in around the edges and loosen up the lines, add little extra wrinkles here and there, some with hatching, some with areas of black, and the consequence of that dirtying up the edges of the heavy black makes it feel like the shadows are emerging somewhat as opposed to really starkly stopping and starting. This little shadow right here that I'm creating from underneath the shoulder plate and onto the breastplate is a good example of using hatching to try and create a genuine gradient. So I want it to start from black and to slowly ease out into hatching, and that gives me a slightly more realistic appearing shadow. A key thing with digital e inking, simply because it's, it's so easy to do, is just to use an eraser and then go in and create little highlights throughout your shadows sometimes even hatching back into the shadow using the eraser. These little highlights tend to give just a hint of reflected light, which is often on the opposing side of a curved surface or the lip of an object. A little use of eraser in here just adds to the detail and makes the figure feel all the more intricate, all the more textured, and all the more realistic. With a metal surface like the breastplate, I've found that it looks pretty good to go in and create little circles, hollow out circles within the black, and that tends to emulate the uneven hammered surface that you would get on the kind of armor that was made at the time. Uh, I like the look of it. It gives me a way to distinguish materials so it doesn't look like cloth. It looks like metal because I only use that technique on metal. Here you can see me too taking the line and running parallel to the shadow angles and again just dirtying them up, softening them up by cutting out a little bit of the black and creating a slight gradient just at the edge of the shadow. Up at the top of the head I have to put these fuzzy antennae on and so I'm using a double line to try and create a soft effect. So I'm very lightly going over with the ink creating a little bit of texture, some broken textured lines, trying to give off that sense of softness. I don't want it to look like a leaf uh, and so I'm trying to make it feel softer than a leaf. This gauntlet is a good example of creating areas of black because I'm not really sure what kinds of texture and what kinds of hatching I want to create. It was difficult for me to visualize, and so I went in and created the areas of black in order to give myself a sense of, okay, this is where the light's coming from, this is where the shadow is, and help me pick and choose where the hatching and the texture and any additional lines would go. This shoulder plate on the other side, it's over on the more shadowed side of the figure, and so I want to have an area of black on there that's quite sizable, but I also left that edge, the top right edge, open in order to give it the feeling that there's a little bit of reflected light, which is something you see frequently with metal. I'm also creating this little shadow on the band around the shoulder plate and filling it with black, but I left a little light above it on the lip, so it would look like the lip is getting hit with a highlight from above. This might seem rather strange to say, but I think this arm that I'm working on here is the best part of the image. I just like the way it turned out. I think I got the foreshortening to look pretty good, and I thought the shadows and the wrinkles looked very natural, so this for me felt like a big success in inking. This is an example of seeing that on the chest plate it just felt a bit empty and so I came back and started adding some additional lines and a little bit of hatching around the edges, something to give it a little more character. This is not the last time I'll be back here. So inking out the edges of the axe and one thing I found is that I was not careful with my pencils and so the axe is not quite straight and also 
the blades don't come down at exactly the same length and so that's going to have to be fixed. So I draw out a line here to kind of see how they should line up. You know, based upon the line you see at the top, I'm trying to equal that. Realize that one's way too short. So go in, erase, redraw, and try to get it down to the same level of depth as the one on the left. One thing I've always struggled with is inking hands, partially just because hands are hard to draw anyway. But ink lines are so harsh, you can't put too many lines or it'll just make a hand look very old or very diseased, one of the two. So, in general, try to keep it light. Just a, a couple of small, thin wrinkles around the knuckles is perfectly fine. And you don't have to draw out the entire fingernail. Oftentimes, just the edge of the nail bed on the bottom and the side. Uh, those tend to work pretty well. little shadow right underneath the fingertip, and I've got something that feels like it actually is touching the axe. With the axe here, I'm going to fill it in with black, but I'm going to leave little areas of white peeking out, small little edges. I find that, again, that makes something look a little bit more metallic, but also it helps me get some of the detail of the axe, even while I'm blacking out almost the entire weapon. This is a complicated moment here because we've moved to a new material. This is a loose cloth, so it's different than the tightly wrapped cloth around the arm. And here I'm going to be using a bigger brush, tapered lines, and I'm going to try and follow the flow of the wrinkles based upon how I think that cloth would hang in this context. It's one of those things that is I've always got room to get better at, but the main way to study it is to uh, hang a cloth and then do cloth studies. Just take a pencil or a pen and do cloth studies, figure out how the gravity operates on cloth. I really love inking handles this way. It's uh, when you create the lines in between and then you just kind of bundle in some black in between the little triangles. And what you get is something that looks rather like a, a handle. It has all this three-dimensionality to it, like a leather-wrapped handle would. Now we've got the shiny little helmet underneath his arm. This is a, uh, it's based upon Saxon helmets uh, from what I looked up. So it's a little bit Viking, uh, but a little bit not as well. And I want to make it a slightly reflective surface. And so you'll see a lot of my attempts at metal inking where I create wobbly shadows and then I cut chunks out of them in a circular pattern with an eraser. Again, I'm trying to get at that concept of the, the blacksmith's hammer leaving little dings and imperfections in the helmet. This is one of the moments of the inking where I was least sure of myself because there on his, I can't even think of what that's called, the bottom of his tunic, I suppose, I knew that it wasn't a deep enough area to need a black shadow, but hatching my way down and creating a gradient is difficult. However, I'm pretty happy with how this one turned out. I managed to keep the lines relatively far apart. They're more or less in the same direction. And I got the gradient working pretty well going from black to lighter. Now this area at the bottom, I'm blacking everything out because I know that this character is supposed to be standing in mist, fog, smoke, however you want to think of it. And what I'm going to do is black out the legs and the bottom of the handle of the axe. And then I'm going to have smoke break up the black so it looks as though you can only partially see it through the mist. Now here I got overexcited and I started drawing a little bit of the girl that you see in the foreground who's looking at this figure. And I should not do that because I'm intending to put those on separate layers so that I have individual control of them in the layers palette. I can change their color independently, etc. So as soon as I realize this, I select it, delete it, and then I try to work around it. The leg here is another good example that you see of the concept of blacking areas in and then using that to determine, okay, where can I put additional detail, hatching, smaller shadows, start with the large, and then move to the smaller. Here I've got myself a nice big ink brush, and I have a mask attached to the ink layer, and I'm just masking out using the brush little areas that make it look like this smoke is passing over in front of the figure. Now that the figure is mostly done, I'm switching to another layer and going into the background to create some smoke at the top. And so I take this at the top, fill it in with black, and realize pretty immediately that it doesn't really look good. It gets too thin up at the top. So I grab it, push it down, and then create the area above it, which is also black. 
and then I make the area above it black as well, and that gives me a better composition. I then put a mask on that layer, take a brush, a nice big ink brush, and then I texture up the edge to make it look more smoky. All the ink brushes that I use do come from the same packet, and I will put a link below. Uh, it is something that is for sale, but it's not a sponsor. I just like them. Now that I'm working up front on a separate layer for the characters in the corner, over whose shoulder we're viewing this figure, I'm going to use a much bigger brush because I want to differentiate the figures in the foreground from the figure in the midground. So thicker lines is a really easy way to do that, reserving my thin and small lines for the figure where I want most of the focus to go. I love shots like these that look over a figure's shoulder and makes it feel like you're standing with them seeing what they see, but when I do that, I tend to want to black them out pretty heavily to make sure that the eye goes towards the light. So I want us to know that they're there, but I want us to look past them towards what they see. And one of the easiest ways to do that is just create some heavy shadows on the back of the head, top of the head, and the shoulders. I love creating little smoke lines, and again, keeping them on a separate layer so that I can control them later, adjust their color, or even get rid of them if I want to. One of the important things with drawing smoke lines is just the motion, just getting a sense of motion like this is moving. Smoke never just rises up, it moves one direction or the other as it rises. And I try to keep a flow of that within the composition. All right, that is the basics of inking. I'm going to leave this right here, and you can stay tuned later for the color process on this piece, where I'm going to do a full-on video just talking about how to color an ink illustration digitally. Stay tuned for that, and I'll see you in the next video.